Greetings, and we must remind you yet again that we are at Word in the Park in uh, Opera Holland Park in Holland Park in West London on June the 3rd in the afternoon, 2 till 4.15. It's going to be awfully good, isn't it, Dave? It's going to be awfully good. The weather's going to be fabulous. It's going to be remarkably. It's, it's going to be the day of the year, as it has been in the two previous years that we've done it. But this year, that's even more assured. Uh, and let's remind everybody who we've got we got John Higgs talking about his book um, about the Beatles and James Bond and the British psyche. We've got Leslie Ann Jones talking about 60 years of the Rolling Stones, which will be pretty much to the day that week, 60 years since the release of their first record. And we got Bob Stanley talking about his book about the Bee Gees. You've been reading that this which week. Which I've been reading, and it's fantastic. You forget, Bee Gees, of course, went to Australia, pretty much branded as juvenile delinquents. They were Remember? transported, effectively. They were transported. They were got out of the country. The Bee Gees of all people so badly behaved at school. There are so many extraordinary bits there. There's a bit where they decide to come back to England, and they've written that they're really quite big stars, quite established stars, actually, in, in, in Australia. And they're halfway back in the Suez Canal where they get a note saying they're now number one in Australia. And uh, they've they've thrown it all in to go to see uh, at NEMS, you know, Brian Epstein's company, uh, which they do. And, of course, the whole thing takes off fantastically. And it's just a, a series of massively high peaks and massive troughs. Well, the bit I'm at the moment is, is where they're out in the honky chateau and magically synthesising the soundtrack to Saturday Night Fever. And it, it's just thrilling to see how the, the various ways that they arrived at that absolutely extraordinary sound. Didn't it happen because the drummer had to go home to the a drummer funeral? drummer had to go home for a yeah. funeral. And so they didn't know what to do, so they just got, I don't know, eight bars of what he'd done, and they just looped it. And they yep. decided that they liked the loop and then changed all the textures of the music they were playing, and they developed their falsetto style at that point. So all those things came together into something, you know, absolutely extraordinary. It's a brilliant book. It's going to be great. So that's Bob Stanley. He's going to be talking about the Bee Gees, his book, Children of the World. And we're also delighted to say we're going to be joined by our old pal and friend of the pod, Claire Grogan, who's going to be celebrating 40 years since being on the cover of Smash Hits. <laughs> And uh, and being in the top ten, so she's going to talk about forty years and more of being, being Claire Grogan. So that's all at Word in the Park on June the third in Holland Park. Make sure you get your tickets. Links below. <laughs> You're listening to a podcast from The Word. Uh, Stack Waddy Game, I'm uh, indebted. We are indebted, in the words of Cyril Fletcher of That's Life, uh, to John Norris, listener, who suggested this idea for a Stack Waddy, which I went off and researched. And so, Mark Ellen, what you have now is five names, okay? Five names. Go on. One of them is the name of a member of the fall, Okay. Oh, right. okay. One of them is the name of a member of the fall, and the other four are characters played by Bernard Cribbins in various <laughs> TV. Oh, that's good. <laughs> oh, that's good. good because both seem to have kind of you think of cardigans and <laughs> find some mild, don't you? The strong <laughs> scent of cigarettes. This is you, good. Flat you, caps. Yeah. You do. So, okay, five names, and four of them are characters played by Bernard Cribbins. And one of them is a member of the fall. Okay, here we go, Mark. I'm going to give you the five names. Spencer Bertwistle. Spencer Bertwistle. Right. Wilfred Mott. Wilfred Mott. Dougie Wingate. Dougie Wingate. Frank Cosgrove. Frank Cosgrove. And finally, Herbert Soppit. Herbert Soppit. One member of the fall, four characters played by Bernard Cribbins. Can you identify the member of the fall? Oh, my goodness me. Those are good. Spencer B Bert Whistle sounds like a, an out-of-work driving instructor, and I think he's, I think he's by uh, Bernard. Was it Wilfred Mott? Wilfred Mott, again, dotty old math teacher. <clears throat> Dougie Wingate. Oh, that's possible. Frank, was it Cosgrove? Cosgrove. Cosgrove. And Herbert Soppit. 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 Herbert Soppit has got to be a made-up character, as is Frank 
Cosgrove, I think. I'm saying that the one that's the real member of the four, that's a brilliant, brilliant analogy because they're so similar, aren't they? Is Dougie Wingate. Am you'd I right? Be, you'd be wrong. You'd be uh, wrong. Go on. Dougie Wingate was a character that Bernard Cribbins played in Midsummer Murders. Ooh. Wilfred Mott was a character he played in Doctor Who. Frank Cosgrove was a character <clears throat> he played in Down to Earth. And Herbert Soppet was a character he played in When We Are Married. It's so Spencer the Bird member Whistle. of the fall That's was fantastic. Spencer Bird's Whistle. He played, he played drums on their albums between 2001 and 2008. So he they, stepped out of Blanding's Castle too, doesn't he? Uh, yeah. and so thanks very much to John Norris for, very a nice. for suggesting that idea. And if you've got an idea that's yeah, yeah. Uh, as good as that, you know, send it to us. We'd be delighted to hear it. Good work. So it's been a busy week this week for uh, Ed Sheeran, you know, who's been putting on his shirt and tie, I'm glad to see. Uh, and playing uh, guitar you know, in court, wasn't he? Uh, playing guitar in court. To whereas... demonstrate that the songs that they're accusing him of, is is it thinking out loud his song has been, uh, he's been, he's been sued by the... The estate owning Let's Get It On by Marvin Gaye, I think, isn't it? And has that been resolved? I don't think so. I don't believe so. It's still going on. It's a very complicated case. We can see it's been it's been sued by uh, Ed Townsend, or the heirs of Ed Townsend, uh, who co-wrote it uh, with uh, with with Marvin Gaye. Uh, and the, first of all, there was a, a debate as to whether this individual had had, I think, the legal term is standing. To actually instigate this action, because they were they were, um, I think they were adopted by somebody else. So their relationship with Ed Townsend was not clear. Yeah, yeah. And also, if you look into the background of these cases, there is so much money to be won in these cases of supposed plagiarism uh, nowadays that you're getting kind of what you might call ambulance chasing lawyers going around trying to try to scare up people who've got some kind of relationship to some huge song from 40, 50 years ago. And it's and always suggest- the people with the most money. Is it? It's always Lady Gaga, Rihanna, et cetera, isn't it? You know, well, it's always the people who've had a huge hit yeah, yeah, there's because of- that's where the money is. You know, it's always the, you know, we keep re- repeating this thing again and again, you know, that uh, where there's a hit, there's a writ. They don't come after anything that wasn't a huge hit because they won't get a lot of money out of anything that wasn't a huge yeah. hit. And it's always it's almost framed in terms of this is this is theft, this is copying, this is absolutely disgraceful. On the assumption that they're sitting down and just listening to a song and saying, I'm going to write down that chord sequence or that melody and directly lift it, which I, I think is very unlikely to happen, don't you? I think the whole notion of copying, it just seems ridiculously, you know, inappropriate and, you know, metaphor for what is going on here, you know, that if you look at how how music is, well, for a start, we talk about it being written. Well, most of the time it's not written at all, you know. It's, it's worked on in the studio, you know. Somebody plays a bit, somebody sings a bit, somebody plays a bit more and so forth. And it may not even be written down at all, you know. We're, very often we used to find this, you know, going back to smash hits, didn't we? You used to find you get a record at number one. Yeah, you'd ask for the and lyrics. Ask, and they you'd have to pay for the lyrics. lyrics. You pay the the publishing company for the lyrics, and then you say, have you got the lyrics? They go, no, we haven't got them at all. <laughs> and very often they'd have to get back to the singer, who'd have to go and listen to the record and write down what it was that he thought he remembered yeah, singing, absolutely. you know. Yeah. So the idea that it's it's kind of like somebody might write a novel or a poem just seems not very appropriate at all. And so if you look at the way, if you look into the way that um, uh, Let's Get It On, which is the the case at issue here, how that was written in the first place, you know, there were two or three people involved in it, all writing different bits. It first of all had totally different lyrics, and then somebody said, no, let's do it like this. It ought to be about sex. You know, it wasn't about it originally. And so... That that's a very loose process, and then Ed Sheeran making his record, however many years later, fifty years later, or whatever, is an equally kind of loose process. And the idea that anybody at any stage said, "Wow, this is just like let's get it on," that's a good idea, just seems very far fetched to me. 
you know, you listen to the record, and once somebody draws your attention to the fact that it's supposed to sound like Let's Get It On, you can hear it. You can There's, hear it, and I think he drew attention to that fact himself by actually playing it once in a concert, which they're using it in the in the lawsuit against him. But also, I think it's a, there's two separate sides of it. There's the melody, and there's the chord sequence. Yeah. You know, famously, people go on and on and on about how, uh, you know, no woman, no cry. So you can sing, you know, um, you can sing uh, Let It Be over the top of it and vice versa. But, I mean, they're not the same tune, and actually not even really quite the same chords. So I, 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 in in neither case with Ed Sheeran does it sound like they're the same chords or the same tune. It's just got something of the sensibility, isn't it? Which is bound to happen. But also, if you, you know, what do you say? No one, no woman, no cry and let yeah, it be. Yeah, let it be. Okay. So, you know, no sa- stage listening to no woman, no cry. Do you think that's wow? This is like let it be, right. and I'm and I'm liking it because it's like let it exactly. be exactly. And yeah. on the no stage in 1974, did Bob Marley put on a copy of Let It Be and go, right, I'm taking that chord Absolutely. sequence. Absolutely. It just didn't happen. If but you what? start a, chord, a song with a certain chord, there are natural chords to go to. And uh, so many songs have been written that it's absolutely inevitable. You won't, you, won't, uh, you won't stumble across something that's already existed. And also, I mean, I've no experience of writing songs, but I've got a lot of experience of writing. And when you write... You're, you're constantly playing with words and tone of voice and so forth and trying to think out how, how to frame something. You know, it very, very rarely springs straight away from the back of your mind, does it? Yeah. You, know, you, you work at it. And, and as it becomes pleasing to you, when it starts to resolve itself into a, into a sort of shape. Yeah, it has a rhythm. Uh, and I'm sure it's the same thing with music. Completely. And if you, if you if whatever you're doing has resolved itself into a pleasing shape, it's highly likely that you're not the first person to ever have done that. Yeah, because there aren't that many ways of doing right, that. Because it just sounds pleasing to the human ear, doesn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely. That, that's that's all of us. And uh, you know, and so how do you learn to write? Well, you learn to write by loads of reading, don't you? Simple as that. You yeah. Know, yeah. Everybody, loads of people read. But you've got to read, and then you've got to read kind of analytically to a certain extent, haven't you? Because you read enough, yeah. you read it in a way that, oh, I can see how that works now. I'm starting to see how that works. It's like I only recently realized that P.G. Woodhouse, you know, who you and I, you and I, I'd Revere. Like, he always, always puts the funny word right at the end of the line. I'm sure he didn't mean to, yeah. but that's what he does, you know. And, and once you know that, you think, and that's his useful guidance, you know. That's that's the kind of thing that works. And I'm sure, you know, songwriters... The sound like G.K. Chesterton falling into a sheet of tin. Was it? Was, was that like... Yeah, it's, it's, yeah it's, it's a troop of cavalry. Troop of cavalry crossing a tin bridge. <laughs> that's brilliant. <laughs> tin bridge. Tin it's bridge. The, you can it's hear always it. the absurd things at the end of the yeah, line. Yeah, tin yeah. bridge, you know, sort of... The uh, you know into the man on the esplanade outside the hotel Splendide in Cannes, over his face there there stole the uh, look of anxiety that usually indicates an Englishman is about to talk French. <laughs> talk French. <laughs> talk French is the payoff, isn't it? It's absolutely the payoff. You've got very the short words. Short words too, really short words. Really short words. Leaving, really leaving short him words. in the air. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. He's full of that. Anyway, sorry, that's getting that's off the so point. Good. But um, and I'm sure if you're writing songs all day, every day, you are, you know, you are realizing, oh, this is how Paul McCartney did that. You yeah. Know? This is what makes this song work, or Paul Simon, or anybody who's come before. It doesn't mean that you're sitting there and copying it, because that it, that kind of implies you think you're getting away with something. The only person I think who probably uh, I get the impression really did do that was Noel Gallagher. I remember interviewing him, and he in 1993 or four, whenever the first album came out, and he told me he'd sat down and and cigarettes and alcohol was stolen from T Rex. And he'd stolen from Abba, he'd stolen from Crowded House, he'd stolen from U2 and, and the New Seekers. And I think partly the reason he did that was because he wanted to make the point that these unfashionable songwriters were still ones yeah. that he enormously admired. Yeah. You know, Abba at the time weren't that hip. No. I mean, even if he did, he didn't care. And he didn't mind if he was sued, which I think on various, various occasions he has been. But, you know, I think it's, um, 
I think what's going on in, in, you know, it's in the States, isn't it, of late, it's kind of, it's, it's heading for a scoundrel's charter, this. It's, you know what I mean? It's a, anybody thinks, I can make a oh, few yeah. quid out of this, you know. And and so you're getting Partly people coming. hoping they'll settle out of court just and to, all, to avoid also, the, let, uh, the irritation. And also, let's not forget, it, the people who wrote these songs, in most cases, are dead, you know, yeah. and, and the rights have passed to some bank, effectively. Yeah. <laughs> That's what it is. There's people investing in these things, you know. It's... Um, it's not taking it's not taking bread from the poor man's table. This isn't at all. You know, this, really. is, this is directing wealth to people who already have quite a lot of it, and uh, with a very inhibiting uh, effect. I would have thought on uh, on songwriting. It, I mean, surely you know it can't go on like this. You would have thought not, but you know we'll have to wait and see. As they say in the newspapers, the case continues. The Word Podcast, prime cuts of popular culture served fresh each week. So, Mark, say Santana. Well, I always thought it was Santana, but it's mm-hmm. Santana. You say you say Santana, I say Santana. How would I know? It's a Spanish word. I come from Yorkshire. You know, these two things don't meet at all, do they? They, they you know, are, are different approaches to vowels. But anyway, the thing about Santana, or you call them whatever you want to call them, I rediscovered them in the last week. I found myself playing, do you know, Caravanserai? It's fun. The opening track on Caravanserai, the instrumental. Yes. With the crickets and the string the bass crickets, playing that weird, that weird time signature. Oh, my God, that's brilliant. Do you know I what it's called? That record. It's called the, it's, this is where, this is where Carlos Santana, who started off doing songs called Soul Sacrifice and, you know, Jingo Low Bar and things like that. Yeah. Within a few albums, he got a record out. The opening track is called Eternal Caravan of Reincarnation. I know. <laughs> That's the fastest, fastest change to the kind of, um, ethereal you can imagine indication that you're doing terribly well you can do what you want because they started <laughs> off you forget they start off with kind of pop songs evil ways on the first album just a yeah. pop song really wasn't it not written by them of course but you know no I, well that's the one of the things about them is they weren't very good songwriters really because most of the most of the the songs that are associated with santana black magic woman and things like that were when were songs taken from other people um, Which really contributed to Fleetwood Mac's success, actually, because that was they had a so. hit with that than they did, didn't they? I suppose so, but but their instrumentals are just astonishing. And the one you talked about, Eternal Caravan oh, of Re- Reincarnation, that opens Caravan Sai. The even the more impressive thing is the is the tune, the track that ends it. Every step of the way comes right at the end of that, which yes. is an absolutely astonishing instrumental. And of course, this is a long time ago. You know, this is this is this is fifty years ago, more than fifty years ago since that album. Well, the first came out. round came out, yeah, sixty nine. I think I was fifteen when like, it came out. First, first one probably came out earlier than that, didn't it? First one, I don't know. No, I think, it was, no, I think it's uh, early sixty eight. Because oh, the, it's a great record. They're on fill your head with rock on something yeah. like that. And uh, anyway, it's a long time ago, you know. So, so this came didn't out. Didn't it seem exotic at the time? Hearing those Latin, re- I'd never really it, heard anything like here's that. Here's the point. Here's the point. It still does. Yeah. This is fifty years later. Fifty years later, and nobody has done what Santana did, and certainly nobody's done it better. It is astonishing. That is fifty years since Caravanserai. Okay, yeah. fifty-one years. Now, take 50 years away from 1972, and where are you, Mark? The First World War has only just ended. It's 1922. (laughs) You know what I mean? 1922, there's barely any recording. Radio is not launched. You know, that's absolutely astonishing. So if you played a record from, you know, from the early 20s, and you played a record made in 1972, they would sound like they came from completely different planets. Totally different universes. Yeah. Whereas you can play Caravanserai today. You can play Caravanserai today, and you wouldn't know that it had been made 50 years ago. Yeah, it sounds like it's made yesterday. It's, it's absolutely ago. astonishing. You know, I suppose it's a technology, aesthetics, its way of playing, you know. It's, um, you know, there, there are hardly any 
kind of what you might call electronic instruments on that. You know, so it's just it's a lot of percussionists. It was uh, a lot of percussionists. That was the thing that really knocked me out. I can remember there were six of them, but four were members of the rhythm section, weren't there? With yeah, bongo players, Mike Shreve, and uh, and the bass player, and also that, there's that incredible clip of them playing "Soul Sacrifice" at Woodstock. I think Michael Shreve, Mike Shreve, has only had only just turned. 20. Oh, oh yeah, they're, I think the whole band, the teenagers. oldest member of the band, is twenty two. It's astonishing. And Car- yeah, so Carlos Santana had had kind of established himself as a musician in, in Mexico and then had come to San Francisco and yeah. kind of started again. And had got to Woodstock, and how old? 22? 22, or 22. 20. I think he was 22. <laughs> he was the oldest man. I think none of them were over 22. It's absolutely astonishing. It's, it's, a, it's an amazing record. I even found myself playing um, his record with John McLaughlin, which I'd never really heard before, Love, Devotion and Surrender. Which is fantastic. Oh yeah, um, and uh, of course he's still with us. Um, but I don't think I don't really think playing anymore. I think I'm right in saying I think he's been ill. Um, but uh, it's still it with is, us and, and ludicrously young, of course. It, it is just remarkable. I do urge people if you haven't listened to Santana in a long time, go and listen to a record like Caravan Story, and I defy you to to indicate any sign of it being done 50 years ago rather than being done yesterday absolutely astonishing the word podcast it passes the time so bill drummond was 70 yesterday the, the 70 the day before we're recording this anyway and uh, we were there dave <clears throat> at what was effectively pretty much the moment he retired which is astonishing and which i i note that the the observer once rated as the fifth greatest uh, publicity stunt of all time Number one being Elvis joins the army. Number two, the Sex Pistols on the boat in the river. I know. Number three, Robert Johnson sells his soul to the devil. Number four, Madonna publishes a dirty book. But fifth was the KLF's final appearance. The KLF had won at the Brit Awards. They'd won Best Group or something, hadn't they? And they came on, and we were there. It was at the Hammersmith Odeon. It was. And they came on with extreme noise terror. They came on With machine guns. They came on first. Yeah, they opened the show. And it was one of the loudest things I've ever heard in my life. George Salty, you remember? I Sir George Salty. Forget. Sir George Salty, the you know the great conductor, who was in the audience to pick up his classical best classical recording award. He literally fled to the exits. He went past me. I was sitting on the aisle. He fled with his fingers the, in his ears. With his finger in his ears. I, I don't blame him. No, I mean, that, that was loud enough to, to do. You know, I was right? shocked. I can remember, my God. It, was, it made you feel quite unwell, actually, that volume. <laughs> yeah. And but what an extraordinary guy, because re- they kind of retired then, didn't they? They said that's it. And then they cancelled their, they deleted their back catalogue, which would have lost them a fortune. And then they gave away all the money in the in the Isle of Jura, which they really did. We had Mick Houghton on the podcast, didn't we? Who'd written a book about them. It was the PR for various of uh, Bill's uh, projects. And they clearly burned a lot of money. Whether or not it was a million pounds, I don't know. But it was wads and wads and wads. It a huge amount. And then he kind of retired, and he's done not very much. Since. Well, no, he's done loads. It's been nothing in the kind of in the kind of musical area. He did a thing where he he, he instigated No Music Day. When you look at his website, you think, has he has he just hacked into this himself and <laughs> just made it all up? But No Music Day is on the 22nd of November, St. Cecilia's Day, the patron saint of music. He had a thing observed in Scotland for five years where they had no music played on Radio Scotland and only only uh, only uh, no, no music or jingles. He formed a choir. Uh, he formed a, a, a web-based project including mydeath.net where you can plan your own funeral. And then he went on tour, on a world tour, doing paintings, stopping every few months in a, in a, in a capital city and painting 25 paintings, which is pretty unusual, isn't it? This man's he's let a, me, he's let a me, performance artist. Let me, let me ask you a question. <clears throat> yeah. You know, the, the whole idea was he burnt a load of cash. Would anybody burn a lot of cash now in a stunt? Because we kind of stopped believing in cash, haven't we? Yeah. I can go into the West End of London and frequently do without any cash on on my person at all, which is something at the beginning of lockdown would have been inconceivable. 
Yeah. Nowadays, everybody does it. You know, you swipe your phone or whatever. And so cash doesn't have that kind of totemic quality, does it? And so nobody would bother to do a stunt involving a load of cash, would they? Well, you know? Joe Lysett did one recently, didn't he? The, the did he? Comedian, where he shredded £10,000, I think. But it caused, I mean, there's quite a lot of grief about it. People just thought it was just a, an appalling thing to do in this day and age. Oh, really? It was just... At a, time when, at a time when you can't, um, you know, when, when everyone's a bit strapped for cash, really, it seemed appalling. But he got a lot of, a lot of attention for it. But right. no, you're right. Yeah, it's funny. Mm. Talking of uh, the KLF and Bill Drummond, actually, I should, should also mention, John Higgs wrote a book about the KLF, which is actually, and this doesn't often happen with uh, music books, which has actually been republished in an expanded edition uh, oh. quite soon. So there will no doubt be copies of that if you happen to be coming along to Word in the Park on June the 3rd. And if not, why not? Um, you know, our people will be signing books, selling and signing books and so forth. And so there are no doubt be copies of that there. So the KLF is one of those things, uh, you know, the story gets more extraordinary the more the events kind of recede in the rear view. <laughs> He's fantastic. He's a kind of performance artist. He was an artist before he started out, really. Yeah. And he always thought of everything as being a massive stunt. But the fortunes that he's made and lost, I, re I really admire him. I think he's really, really interesting. And uh, he's a kind of McLaren character, but yeah. more extravagant and more creative than McLaren. He's talking, talking of no music day, I must just draw your attention to a thing Jamie Bowman sent me uh, a couple of weeks ago, actually. I know we were we were uh, uh, wittering on in recent weeks about how fed up we were with the sound of amplified busking that we didn't think we didn't think a busker ought to be audible more than twenty feet away or whatever was our distance. And this has been taken up by the good burgers of Bury in Lancashire, and so in Bury they're uh, taking steps to ban. Amplified sound equipment in Bury Town Centre because the local local shopkeepers and shoppers alike are started to complain about it. So you know we we may be there at the beginning of a, of a wave that's going to spread the country. Well, well, I think we're right, don't you? Because the idea is that amplification is cheating, and it's an imposition, and it means that anybody can't avoid hearing the busking. Surely busking is all about the skill of. Putting on a performance or a stage act of some—it's trying to get people. It's trying to get people nearer them to you. Draw them in. If you can you draw know. them in, then you've done something to entertain them. Not if you've, uh, you know, if you've reached them a hundred yards amplifiers. away. <laughs> that's a, yeah, that's yeah. a different thing. That's noise pollution. But I don't expect young Alex to agree. No doubt we'll be hearing from him later. This is a junction in the Word podcast. It separates that bit from this next bit. I have to say, I was delighted to see that HMV are reoccupying the store at 363 Oxford Street that I used to work in damn near 50 years ago. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, all the very best with that. I don't know how much resemblance this will have to the kind of shop that I worked in, you know, which was a big superstore, which had a classical department and soundtracks and tapes and all those kind of things. But anyway, it did strike me again the other day when I had some time to kill in the West End of London. And you and I have both worked on Oxford Street, you know, or near Oxford Street, near Oxford Circus for years. We worked just around the corner from the HMV, didn't we? And one of the time-honoured ways of killing time in the West End of London was that you could go into bookshops or record shops. There were loads of them. And bookshops and record shops are not like clothes shops or shoe shops or whatever. You know, they have a kind of news value to them, don't they? Absolutely. You, you go in and you see what's new or what's on the chart or I don't know, what, what events are taking place. You don't necessarily buy anything, do they're just there. And for years, that's what you did in the West End of London. If you had half an hour to kill, you popped into HMV or Virgin or Waterstones or Borders. <laughs> Remember all those? Mowbrays, yeah, yeah. all those kind of places. And of late, you know, as of the last 10 years, there has not been, I think I'm right in saying this, there has not been a single record shop or bookshop 
on Oxford Street or Regent Street. I think I'm right in that. Aren't yeah, I, I think so. But there's lots I, just off them, things like Sister Ray and stuff, but none of the really big... Well, there's not lots. Schools. There's a lot, lots. There's a few. No, lots, lots there's a handful. There's like two or three in Soho. That That's your lot, really. Um, and, you know, and nothing like the range that it used to be. And I think that's been a real shame, you know. And and obviously, I, w- you, I would guess one of the things that's got HMV back in there is the landlords must be offering fantastic deals for people to come back in, you know, because they want Oxford Street to be regenerated. You know, they, they don't like vacant Not stores. just full of American candy shops. Absolutely. Of course, yeah. this was, you know, has been of late an American candy store. That, that you know, eyesore and abomination that we see all over the place in the West End at the moment. And they're kind of Westminster Council are fighting back against that. Uh, and uh, so you know, it'll be good. To, but it'll the be HMV, we have such fond memories of it because we were around the corner, didn't we? Around the time of, I suppose, well, that was you, you were, you and stuff like that. The bigger one, yeah, the, the later one. That That's was the, the later that was the early one up, up the top end of Oxford Street, Boxwood Circus. And there was always somebody, Echo and the Bunny Men, or somebody always playing on the roof at lunchtime. And it was great, we went down there all the time. Or lots of lots of lots of in store appearances, weren't there? Lots of, lots of pop stars turning up and signing records. It was brilliant. Yeah, so you know, all, all the best, uh, all the best of them to in re-establishing it. The Word Podcast: Two cocoa tins and a piece of string. I saw this interesting little news story uh, this week about uh, the about, about the Black Keys, who publicly declared that they were insulted. That was the <laughs> word they used by their offer of the amount of money they're offered to play Glastonbury. It's really interesting because, of course, Glastonbury pays. Uh, I know because I was quite involved with it uh, for a while when uh, various e magazines were were uh, were covering it and um i got to find out lots about it and they don't pay very much well partly because um y- you know it's a, it's a ch- it's a charity organization you know last year i think they gave two million over two million pounds to oxfam so they're trying to it's not as profit driven as as the majority in fact they're just trying to make even and do it again next year but uh in the in the uh, coverage of this story about the Black Keys, Emily Evis said that they'd paid McCartney and Coldplay two hundred thousand pounds each, which is very very little, isn't it? Two hundred thousand pounds is, is you know when you're a, a, an act of that stature because you're you're imagining you're getting several millions probably to, to to headline big European festivals isn't very much. But of course, the reason people do it is it's Glastonbury. You want to be involved. It's fantastic good credibility. It reaches a completely different audience, and obviously live tv so the publicity value of it of being associated with it is enormous but i thought it was uh strange that they'd uh, they would uh, they would complain so loudly about the fact that they would never consider playing this festival ever again because they were insulted by the amount of money they were off <laughs> it's a bad move to me i don't know yeah it does really um it's interesting isn't it you know 200 000 pounds you say that's not much money well, everybody knows that's a lot of money, really. But you know, well, if you're, you're an enormous, well, yeah, but it, touring it, with all that stuff. And that well, okay, that's that's the point. The, 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 the expenses, know. the expenses are huge. You know, huge. so if if you are getting two hundred thousand pounds for a gig, how much of that are you are you netting? You know, yeah, maybe a hundred thousand. I don't know. Yeah, um, I've really no idea at at all. You know, it's very difficult making judgments about about these these sums, isn't it? You know, but um, I'm sure you're right. It's not even publicity, is it? It's it's something kind of beyond publicity because publicity always makes me think of newspapers. It always makes me think of, of oh, how many people are reading the newspaper? Oh, yeah, hardly any, hardly any at all. Um, and uh, but it's more people know that you're doing it. You know, and they kind of know that by magic or by social media, don't they? Now, um, they they won't they won't read about it, they won't see it, but they'll be aware that it's going on, and they, the awareness has a value, doesn't it? You it know, does. because because it it drives up the perception that you're you're desirable, which kind of drives up your um your. Uh, your visibility and drives up your and if price. you're one of the old guard, it associates you with a lot of fabulous young and fashionable souls. That you I tell know, you, what, I tell you, what, I tell you, what, I saw this thing this week. I couldn't help thinking of this when Bruce Springsteen did his 
Barcelona show opening his European leg of his tour this week. And of course, you don't know that we've all heard and seen. Well, I haven't seen it in the newspaper. This is a classic, but I've seen it that, that, you know, Michelle Obama appeared on stage with him during glory days. And I just thought, how extraordinary it is that people that famous still would like to be slightly more famous, wouldn't they? You know? Yeah. I mean? <laughs> you would have thought Michelle Obama, you know, you know, why great affection and respect for her and so forth. And you would have thought she'd say, you know, if Bruce Springsteen said, if you were backstage, Mark, at a Bruce Springsteen show, and Bruce Springsteen said, yeah, why don't you come and join the choir on Glory Days? As part of you, oh, no, nobody wants to see me, for God's sake. I'd be an embarrassment. You know what I mean? I would let the side down. Whereas if you're as famous as Michelle Obama, you don't think that, do you? You think, no, Michelle Obama, we're crying out loud. <laughs> I, I think he's just a brilliant publicity generator. Oh, well, he, well, I mean, he's so is she. Yeah, she's got a book out, babe. She's got a book she's out. She's always got a book out. And, yeah. and the point about Michelle Obama, she's sold, she's made a fortune out of book publishing. Fortune. Now, I don't know, I haven't read any of the books and I've no reason to believe they're not really good. But it's celebrity is what gets those deals. Completely. And, uh, you know, so every time you appear on stage at Bruce Springsteen or whatever, it, 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 you know, you, your value just goes up, doesn't it? It's fantastic. The night I, before that, they went out for a meal. The, the Springsteens, uh, the Spielbergs and yes, the Obamas yes. went out to a restaurant in Barcelona <laughs> and they didn't know who'd booked it. And so when they turned up, you can imagine what that restaurant must have thought. Unbelievable. They just, but they made sure they had a photograph of them with all the staff and all that. I'm sure um, they did. And also, it makes you realize just how hip Michelle Obama is. And I'm trying to think of any other. First ladies or other halves of major politicians who, I mean, you know, Sam Cam, Carrie Johnson, do you know what I mean? The only one I can think of was Carla Brunei. Carla Brunei was married to Sarkozy, wasn't she? Yeah. And you interviewed, actually, once. Not, yeah. No, I didn't. Um, didn't I don't think I did, no. Uh, um, but anyway, um, no, I think I think you're right. Well, she's, you know, Michelle O'Brien is, is just... He's very, she's very famous and very, and very loved and very ticks a lot of boxes, yeah. you know. Um, but uh, I, I did think that was absolutely fascinating, you know, that, um, and of course, big as Bruce Springsteen is, if he gets Michelle Obama on stage doing one number in Barcelona, the picture goes all over the world. All over the world. And all and, she has to do is just hit the tambourine a few times. She looked brilliant. She looked yeah, really great. Yeah. It yeah. worked. It did. I was impressed. So Harry Belafonte uh, finally passed away in the last week. I don't remember a time when I wasn't aware of Harry Belafonte. I think Harry Belafonte's The Banana Boat Song is the first song, along possibly with Elvis, that I can actually remember coming out. I think I was four when it came out. And in in my mind, I can remember that coming out. I can just remember everybody singing it. It was a massive hit, wasn't it? Wasn't there also a pastiche of it? Was it Stan Freeberg, one of those guys, that was always played on children's favourites or whatever? Could have been. Oh, it was kind yeah. of hip, hipster retake of, uh, of the Banana Boat song. And, of course, what, didn't Bob Dylan make his recording Bob debut? Bob Dylan's first ever recording was on, um, was on a Harry Belafonte record. Uh, and I'm not trying to remember which one it was. Which I think he played was. harmonica, didn't he, or something like yeah, that? Yeah, on Midnight Special. Right. He was the harmonica player, that's right. Uh, yeah, yeah. And I think, I think one thing it was fair to say about Harry Belafonte is nowadays absolutely every tin pot actor who's done two tellies and, a, and a, was once in the bill on, if you look on the Wikipedia place, page, they will all say, actor and activist. Yes. Well, Harry Belafonte he invented was that. an actor and activist. He really was. He invented that. Yes. Whatever you did, Mr. Wikipedia, is nothing compared to what Harry Belafonte did throughout a long and distinguished career. Yeah, and his very, his very early uh, drama lessons, he was in the same class as Marlon Brando and Walter Matthau. That's fantastic, isn't it? His connections were extraordinary. 
You must have thought, I'm never going to make it if you, happen to no. be in that, if you happen to be in that class. Which brings me on to, I'll tell you, I just I wrote, the stat that's been going through my head, two, two things have been going through my head yesterday. I was out in the garden yesterday, Mark. The weather was nice. I, my sh- I had my shorts on yesterday. got my shorts on today. Um, I'm looking forward to the summer with, uh, yeah, with optimism. We anyway, deserve it. two things going through my head. I was reading uh, a book about Shakespeare. Uh, Will in the World, I can't remember who wrote it, Greenwald, whatever. He says that Shakespeare was probably the first member of his family to be able to write his own name. This is just astonishing. So not it's, only did he learn to write his own name, he then wrote it, the <laughs> immortal plays, sonnets, so, poems. So Britain's, he did greatest, it all. Britain's greatest writer, okay, was the greatest at doing something that he was the first in his family ever to do. Ever to do. Now, that's pretty unique, isn't it? It is. You know, incredible. You know, you normally think you build on the, you know, previous generation's skills and so forth. No, he invented it and then perfected it. Absolutely astonishing. And the other thing, the stat that was going through my head yesterday, I read somewhere, um, you know, football academies, you know, all the Premier League teams have academies where yeah. they identify children quite young, you know, six, seven, whatever. These people have got exceptional talent and therefore we're going to get them on our books and we're going to encourage them and we're going to le- get them to learn good football habits and so forth. And then a certain number might come through and play for us. Do you know what percentage of academy players ever play so much as one game for a top-level club? What percentage? Now, bear it's in mind... really, really chillingly low. Bear in mind... 4% or something. It is 3%. No, no, no. 3%. And bear in mind that these are not just kids who fancy themselves as footballers, as most kids do. These are kids who have been identified by adults... At the age Teachers, of seven, coaches, supremely gifted. whatever. The, these lads are exceptional. Get them in here. 3% ever play so much as one game. Now, bear in mind, there are thousands of players who play one or two games and then get sold on or put out on loan or whatever. So the number who actually make it consistently at the top level is way smaller than that. So the the, the the chilling stat there is that 97% of those people at the age of about eight or nine had, and their entire extended family would have would have been well aware of this, had the chance Absolutely. that they might be the next David Beckham or whatever. Absolutely. Uh, and, and they've got to readjust to that afterwards. My God, and then, what a, and then you know, there are people who are always, you know, there are initiatives to, to try and deal with the fallout from this. Yeah. Because... You know, it's catastrophic for loads of 15-year-olds who just let go because all they've been thinking about is, I'm going to be a footballer. Yeah. I don't need to worry about anything else. Don't need to worry about Never even considered another career. All their efforts would have been put into that. And suddenly everything collapses, you know. I don't think you should be allowed to encourage kids at that age, you know. When you know that the the odds against them are, are... are oh, that stark. It's just astonishing. I can't but then remember. it pays off, doesn't it? How old was Ryan Giggs when he was signed? Something like 11. Wasn't he something like 11 years old? Well, I'm sure that he signed some, some kind of, of forms. Yeah. Some, some kind of forms, you know. But but think of all the people alongside them, you know, who never made it at all, you know. And when they were eight years old, they were all equally, equally talented. And I suppose, you know, just... You know, it, it, there's a, the parallel with music is people always say, oh, they should have made it. <laughs> you know, they were really good. They could play. They had good songs. They should have made it. It's luck as much as anything Completely. else. Yeah, it's just, it's, it's not, life is not fair, as you can see, you know, by looking at those stats about football. It's pretty much the same with popular music. Although with popular music, you can kind of elect yourself, can't you, at the age of 18? You can say, I'm interesting enough to form a band. You haven't waited for some adult to say you are. Yeah, have absolutely. You? you know, you haven't, you haven't passed an exam, so to speak. It's only your self belief that says that you're going to make it. 
And the truth is, it's probably 3%. The Word Podcast, one of the few things you really need in life. Did I mention, Mark, this word in your ear is brought to you thanks to NordVPN. Remind me once again, Mark, because it slipped my mind. What does a VPN stand for? It's a virtual private network. Say that again. Virtual private network. Very good. (laughs) And that's a way to keep your data safe on the internet, whether you're logging on at home or abroad, particularly important abroad. VPN protects your identity and encrypts your data so that nobody can steal your identity. And at the same time, it enables you to access the internet via servers in more than 50 different countries which means you can often sidestep region restrictions and stream movies and TV programs from all other, around the world. Talking about programs from all around the world, I made the acquaintance this week of Colin from Accounts. Have you seen that? I've watched I've watched two episodes. You watched two? You're yeah. one ahead of me. Yeah, I've nearly I was, the second. Yeah. And that's an Australian, uh, Australian comedy. Did you notice the kind of disclaimer right at the beginning of it? No, go on. Where it said, it said this, uh, it pretty much said, you know, this, this was filmed on, on territory, you know, stolen from the Aboriginal people of Australia. And we apologize kind of thing. Oh, really? Pretty extraordinary. And, uh, you know, it struck me as a classic case of, uh, you know, how, how we change one taboo for another, you know, because, because Colin from accounts, which I thought was funny contains a scene that I've never seen the like of in any in any comedy um, show ever. Without giving too much away, which scene are you talking about? Well, I can't possibly. It takes place in a bathroom. Oh, yes, uh, it does. But yes. um, I, thought it, I thought it was good. And I have to stop myself saying to my, uh, it's a rare case of me being able to say my daughters, have you seen Colin from Accounts? It's really good. Because you've got to be really careful, I find, with comedies. You can't go around saying, this is brilliant. You'll You're love, gonna this. love this. Yeah, yeah. This is right up your street. Because as soon as you said that to people, the hackles rise, whatever hackles are, their defences go up and they're determined to prove you I found you last night because I was suggesting to my wife that very softly, I said, you might, I said, you might like it. You didn't overcook it. So you might not, I don't know. But I mean, Dave, Dave's seen it and he likes it and I like it. And it's good. Well, and she did like it, but she was kind of horrified by the scene that you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. But I have to say, it's a piece of script writing. Again, I'm not going to give this away, but the basic premise is two people who've never met in a split second have their lives inextricably wound together. It's true. And and the way it happens, the way that happens is the most superb piece of uh, of plot writing. Because, you know, there they are with their lives, perfectly happy uh, at 9 o'clock in the morning. And at 9.15, they've been plunged into this unbelievably tortuous, expensive and complicated situation. It's so clever and so good. And it has anybody who likes The Office will like it. It's got that same kind of agonising comedy, isn't it? It's just the excruciating moment. It's terribly good. I had to Love watch it. it. I had to watch it standing up because, you know, I had to kind of retreat from the telly. Because, you can hide behind a sofa. Well, a little bit of that, yeah. yeah. But anyway, let's uh, let's stop that. Let's not, you know, let's not do it, do it any damage by recommending it too highly. But you might you might enjoy it. So anyway, back to Nord. You can take advantage of the deal where you can try NordVPN by going to nordvpn.com slash your ear, or just use the code your ear to get a huge discount off your NordVPN plan. And one additional month for free and a bonus gift. And it's risk-free because there's a 30-day money-back guarantee. Full details, as ever, in the show notes. The Word Podcast. Fix yourself a drink and it's like being in the pub. Okay, any other business? We're joined by Alex Gold. Hello, Alex. Hello, hello, hello. Have you seen that piece in the New Yorker uh, this week? It's about the National. And it's got a rather splendid photograph. Of the uh, of the five of them, kind of sitting in the snow, really, uh, and and the headline is the sad dads of the national. But they are they, so spectacularly uncaptivating. Aren't they? <laughs> they're the anti-strokes, aren't they? <laughs> they're the anti-strokes. They are completely. I mean, and, they, uh, go on. I was going to say it's not 
It's not that they're not kind of, you know, they're all perfectly reasonable looking, but they've made absolutely no effort whatsoever to make themselves look any more glamorous. Because that's the whole thing, is there have been lots of groups that haven't been very glamorous, but that having not much glamour develops a glamour in itself. The fugs, the mothers of invention, etc. But these guys are just the most normal and ordinary and uh, unprepossessing group I think I've ever seen in my life. They look it's like magic. it's a checkout queue at B and Q, isn't it? it Whatever. Is. You've turned around, you know. Are these people who've turned up, you know, looking yeah. at tools, or are they the national? You know, <laughs> uh, and uh, don't you think? I get the feeling that there are, there are going to be more and more groups who look like that, Alex. Do you think? Yeah. <laughs> There's going to be fewer and fewer young whippersnappers in leather trousers, you know, looking as if, get, come and get me, girls, kind of thing. <laughs> and more guys who look like the national, whose who's wives or partners have said to them, no, you're not going out dressed like that, you know. Where, where are you going today? Oh, I'm going to a band rehearsal. Well, yeah, I feel like musicians are generally less outlandish characters anyway, so it's definitely going in that direction. Um, all the people in spangly trousers are walking around Camden anyway. Yes. <laughs> yeah, they haven't got time to form groups, have they? No. Know, they're too busy out there posing. Whereas, you know, they, they, I mean, how old are the members of the National? They're, they're probably 50, are they, Mark? They must be oh, yeah, they are. Yeah. They're getting on that way. And um, But it's very much that kind of, uh, you know, there's no division between band and audience, is there? The best example of that, I think, and pro- probably the most un- uncharismatic group I think I've ever seen was The Farm. Do you remember The Farm oh, in like right. 1993? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they just, they made absolutely no effort whatsoever to do anything at all <laughs> to make them look like they hadn't just strolled on stage from, uh, you know, wearing the clothes they were already wearing. No, that's yeah, it. It's, it's odd, isn't it? Don't you think that, you know, that now that rock has kind of, <laughs> It's a kind of minority taste, isn't it, really? So it's going gonna, it's gonna to end up like the average group is going to end up like the average jazz group. You know, it's, it's a bunch of middle-aged blokes. Yeah. <laughs> who kind of make a point about the fact that we're not here to excite you. We're just here to play the records. Yeah. There's nothing about us to buy into other than the records. Yeah, there's no artifice. The there's no con. No. There's no spin. <laughs> yes. And uh, it's honesty, I, raw yeah. honesty. I always get the feeling that sort of more and more festivals are, you know, <laughs> the bills on festivals are taken up by groups like that, you know. I feel like bands are formed these days less to change the world and more just to, to be able to get away from the wife for a bit. <laughs> <laughs> you know? It's the it's the garden shed, isn't it? it is. it's, it's the allotment. I think, I think you might be right, you know. It's extraordinary how these... Um, I keep seeing mention of of groups who've um, I can't remember. I was, I was talking to somebody about one well, the other day. I can't remember who it was. It was a group who'd formed I don't know, in the eighties or whatever, and had, had done nothing, well, you know, commercially or anything. But there they were, getting back together again forty years later, and doing like three shows, <laughs> you know. And it was to get out of the house, wasn't it? It was a hobby, you know. It was interesting, actually. Were we talking to Sid uh, Sid Griffin about? Well, legitimise is going to have a drink with your old pals, <laughs> yes. but for a month long period in Europe, you know. So it's just an absolute hoot. Who are we talking to? Yeah. Well, we're talking to Sid when Sid oh, was yeah. uh, Sid Griffin was uh, you know going out with the Long Riders. I think they just finished, haven't they? Yeah, um, they've just wrapped up that tour. And because there they all were 40 years later, you know, and one of them sadly died. So they, 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 that encouraged the rest of them to get together and do it kind of one more time, you know. And that was pretty much, uh, you know, they've all got grown up kids. Oh, yeah. And so forth. <laughs> and it was, can, we can, t- we can afford to take a month off yeah. to go and do I, a I few think The music shows. was the least important thing about it. The it important a- thing was that the old guys got together and drank beer and uh, <laughs> probably played dominoes in the evenings. Yeah, it just talked about things. I can I can see the point. Very if nice. You, we don't need to do that. We've got the <laughs> podcast. Yeah. <laughs> I, saw, I saw one of our old two of our old colleagues this week, Mark, who said, "Do you ever see Mark?" I said, "See is is the 
Is a rather difficult verb to interpret. I see him every day. I don't actually physically see him in the flesh more than <laughs> twice a year or whatever. You know? Yeah, yeah. I know. It's so what else have we got to tell people about, Alex, under any other business? We should uh, remind people once more, word in the park, June the 3rd. Holland June the 3rd. Park. Tickets via the show notes below. Um, we should probably talk a little bit about our Patreon, shouldn't we? Yeah, go on. One of whom is Paul Jackson, who I should mention was the guy who sent me an email this morning. She's saying uh, about Bill Drummond, which reminded me we should mention Bill Drummond as we did earlier. Thank you for that, Paul. Yeah, yeah, I'm so sorry. any communications of any kind, any stack waddies, very welcome. We loved the one earlier on about uh, Bernard Cribbins. Superb. And if you've never taken part, if you're a Patreon supporter and you've never taken part in the Friday night quiz, we start a new one because it's a new month. We start a new one this coming Friday. So if you never take part, now might be the opportunity to uh, to leap in, and you can just turn up and observe. You don't have to. It's a safe. It's a safe space. It's, it's a, a safe, safe space. space. You're among friends. It is. It's we very good promote time. it as that. It <laughs> is definitely, as you want it to be. It's definitely. Precisely. It's definitely a safe space. Um, and if you want to find out about being a Patreon supporter, if you go to patreon.com slash word in your ear is that correct alex I that is, is indeed correct yes patreon.com um, forward slash word in your ear and there you can find details and we look forward to seeing you again next week this podcast was brought to you by the word <laughs> <laughs>